Kelly Townsend. Uh, thank you as always, Jimmy. It's lovely to be back. It's been five years since I've been up here in front of you. Um, I can actually see some familiar faces that were there at the last one, so thanks very much for coming back. Um, we've learned a lot over the last five years, so I'm pleased to present a few different things on top of what we looked at last time. Um, for today's session, I'll go through a brief history of how No More Knots came to be for those of you that aren't familiar with our clinic. Um, we'll have a look at some industry statistics that are specific to our industry and then we'll have a look at what I consider to be the six keys to business success. So you can expect today's session to be interactive. Um, I'll be posing questions to you. I want you to get, I want to get you thinking. Um, you'll be having discussions around this with the people around you. Um, if you own your ideas, then you're more likely to go home and implement them, which is what every presenter up here wants you to do today. So there's a bunch of successful business owners in this room and there are many aspiring ones. So probably at a quick guess, we've got between 500 and 1,000 years of business experience in this room and I've only got 15. So tap into the potential of the people around you because there's really good information in here. So we'll all do things differently within business. There is no perfect way. Um, no more knots as far from perfect. Um, but given we're still in business after 15 or so years, hopefully I've made enough mistakes by now to help you avoid one or two of them. So let's have a look. So in 1998, Many of you would be familiar with working underneath your house. Some of you will be doing it right now. Um, I was seeing 30 clients per week. Then in 2000, we moved into the new building where I lived upstairs and we had six treatment rooms downstairs. We grew that business to, uh, <laughs> we grew that to 100 clients per week and we have five therapists at that time. And yes, I sadly did make them wear orange pants. <sighs> Um, in 2005, we moved to one of our current clinic locations. It was purpose-built and it had 15 treatment rooms. We turned the top picture into the bottom picture and we turned that into that. So last time I was up here, this is what the clinic looked like. We had a team of 23. We had 16 therapists, seven administrative staff, and we were seeing 300 customers per week. Since that time, in 2011, we opened what we call our Taringa Clinic. So we turned the top picture into the bottom one, and we turned that into that. Like Green Slopes, it was purpose built for our business. So between the two clinics, we've so far invested over one and a half million dollars in just in renovation and fit out costs. So when you've got that much debt, there's a lot of pressure on you to make sure that your business works. Today in 2013, we have a team of about 50. This photo is of half of them. We've got 38 therapists and 12 administrative teams. Sorry, 12 administrative people that make up our team. We've just finished rebranding. We've just launched our new website and we've, and we've just uh, redone a full refurbishment on both of our clinics. Reinvesting in our business, our brand and our people is really important to us. This is the graph of the growth of No More Knots over the past eight years. It graphs the number of treatment hours per week. In 2006, we were seeing 151 clients or hours per week. In 2013, between both clinics, we were seeing 637. Our PB to date is 737. This is graphed over eight years, not 15 years, because that's how long it took me to work out that this stuff is important. I share this with you today in the hope that you can take it home with you and do it in your business tomorrow. No More Knots makes decisions based on facts and data, and every good business that I know of does the same. All right, how about we do a survey of hands? Everyone in the air. All right. The purpose of this is to help you understand yourself and the people around you. So please keep your hand in the air if you already are or one day want to run your own business. All right. Please keep your hand in the air if you have a goal and know what the dollar figure amount is for how much you want to be earning per annum in your business. All right, a few hands down. Keep your hand in the air if you have key performance indicators to track your progress. Okay. Keep your hand in the air if you know and measure how many clients you and your business saw last week. Great. 
keep your hand in the air if you know how many of those clients have another appointment back in to see you on the diary. Go. Keep your hand in the air if you have systems developed that document in detail how you do everything that you do within your business. Awesome. <laughs> All right, we've got a really nice range in the room, but as you can see, there's plenty of potential that still exists. So, given a large number of you guys want to either move into your own business or, or, or already are in business, let's get down to business. All right, this is a graph from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It's a graph of all industries. So, according to the ABS, 43% of new businesses that began business in 2008 we're still in operation by the start of 2012. Now that means that for every 100 businesses, in three years, only, only 43 were still operating. That means that 57 out of that 100 had closed if they had zero employees other than the business owner. If they had four, what, between one and four employees, the chance of success is 58% and 42 of those businesses are closed. There are good reasons that these businesses close. Today I want to explore ways that if you choose to go into business, that you stay in business. Now, let's have a look at what those statistics actually mean for us. So, in April 2013, Ibis World, who are an independent national research organisation, released a report entitled The Alternative Health Therapies in Australia. Our industry falls into this category, along with other industries such as acupuncture, naturopathy, chiropractic and osteopathy. The section highlighted this last financial year, it tells us that the average revenue per employee in our industry is $110,000 per year. And it's ranked 522 out of 582 of all industries in Australia which means that we have one of the lowest revenue to employee ratios in any industry. Conversely, wages as a percentage of revenue is significantly higher in rank at 101 out of 582 at about 36%. Too much. We'll get to that. <laughs> that means that each employee doesn't, earn, that doesn't make a lot, but what if they do, but of what they do make, they actually get a substantial portion of it. Note that that's 36%. I don't know about you guys that are in business now, but so many of the graduates that we're seeing coming out of college are, have expectations of 50% 50, 50 plus. And if that was the case, then we'd be at rank number one and simply that would just be untenable for our industry. So the last point that I want to make here is that the average number of employees per establishment is 1.12. 1.12. This ranks us 572 out of 582 industries, which means 98% of other industries are stronger than ours. That means that almost every business is the owner or just the owner in a little bit. That sends alarm bells for me because regarding our industry, because as the ABS reports, the success of any business for one to four employees means that out of every 100, 42 will close in the first three years. That stat climbs to 57% failure rate for the, if you're just the owner operator. So statistically in this room, the person sitting either side of you right now will be out of business in three years. I put this up, I put this up here not to dissuade you from going into business, but to give you a greater appreciation for the challenges and the risks that the owner of that business that you might be working for now has taken and to make you aware of the real challenges that you face if you're going to move into business and that you do need to be smart about it. Ibis World also released what they thought the profit percentage is for businesses in our industry. Um, have a think about what you think that percentage Interest, sorry, what that profit percentage is. Just for the next 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you about what you think the average percent profit is within our industry. Does anyone want to throw some numbers up? 15? You got anyone higher or lower than 15? 10? Not even 5? Okay, so a nice range. All right. Our industry earns an average if I go the right way, of 4.6% profit. 
So an average industry percent profit is the profit that you're left with after you pay for all of your expenses. Yeah. So when you, uh, so I'll cover it right now for you. <laughs> Fair enough. So for some businesses, they will be higher, but equally some will be lower than that. That's the average. So if you aren't in business right now, you might be sitting there in a little bit of disbelief, but I can assure you that's on the money based on the number of businesses that I've spoken to um, in not just the massage industry, but also in other, the other industries like acupuncture, naturopathy, osteopathy. So let's have a look at what that means for us. So if we charge $88 for a massage, and I've chosen 88 because it was easy for numbers, you give 8%, sorry, $8 or 10% of that to the government for GST. So that means that of the 80 that you're left with, 4.6% or $3.68 is your profit. And you have to pay tax on that. The GST can't change. Your expenses are unlikely to change. So what happens if you've got a therapist that asks for a $5 an hour pay increase? Maybe you become a stat. <laughs> so given, to give you an idea of what most people consider a really profitable business, BHP's profit percentage as of the 1st of January this year was 13.16%. Was now granted, their turnover is higher than what we can experience in our industry, but their profit is still only 13 cents in every dollar. The percentage profit in our industry is usually much lower than what people expect. When I've previously asked therapists that work at No More Knots what they think our profit percentage is, I have had answers as high as 50% and that just blows my mind. If you're working for someone right now or you're thinking of moving into business for yourself, please be clear about your financial realities. So how do you avoid simply buying yourself a job so that you can move our business and our industry forward as a whole? That's why I'm here today. Let's have a look at some things so that you can assure that you and the people sitting next to you can be in profitable business in three years. What's the first key to your business success? Happiness? Close. It is. Goals. What you want your future to look like will be different to the person next to you. And how you go about achieving your goals will be different too. How will, we know, how will we know when we arrive if we don't know where we're going? Stephen Covey teaches us in Seven habit, Habits of Highly Effective People that you need to begin with the end in mind. You need to set your goals so you can work backwards. Goals aren't a new phenomenon, but they can be incredibly powerful if you choose to use them. It's the discipline to define your goals that can stump all of us from time to time. If you run your own business, I consider them essential. If you don't run your own business, I consider them essential. It makes sense that your personal and business goals are going to be aligned. Today our focus is on successful business. So, what are your business goals? I want you to turn and talk to the person next to you for the next two minutes about what are your business goals and when are you going to achieve them by? When I want your attention. So, over the last 15 years, I've spoken to probably more than 200 therapists and business owners in various industries about their goals, and there's a common theme that runs amongst them. Um, for most of them, they want to get off the tools and earn a passive income. Now, that's not a goal for all of them, and it may not be a goal for you. And if it's not, you can just borrow from the next format for what your goals actually are. So, there's some essential features for goals that if they're going to be of any success. So they need to be specific, measurable, time bound and written down. So for example, if you want to get off your hands and earn a passive income, be specific. How much passive income do you want per annum? Make it measurable. So if you want to get off your hands, what does that mean to you? Does that mean 10 hours per week? Does that mean zero hours per week? And when will you achieve it by? Will it be in five years, 10 years, by the time your kids leave school? by the time you're age 50. So it's important to understand what your goals mean to you and why. I once spoke to a solicitor on how he measured that if he was successful in business. And he said to me, I know I'll be successful in business when I earn $800,000 per annum. 
that's a lot. And I said, well, what will you do with the $800,000 that you can't do with $500,000 or $300,000? And he didn't know the answer to that. That just seems crazy to me. He's a smart guy. So you need to understand what your drivers are and be really clear about your goals. That's number one, key to business success. Key number two, KPIs. We use KPIs every day, sometimes without really realising that we're using them. They're our guide to keeping us on track. We've spoken about K KPIs today um, in Ebony's and the lack of KPIs that exist in some of the things that she's been talking about. These KPIs will monitor, they will help you monitor your business so that you stay on track and you don't crash. So some examples of KPIs. I know um, I've worked with V8 Supercars previously and one of the V8 Supercar teams actually took the travelling speed, so the kilometres per hour that the car was travelling, they took that out of the dashboard. Now that might seem like a really essential KPI, but they actually found out that that's not an essential KPI. Those cars are going as fast as they physically can. They found that if the driver could see what the speed was, he was actually quite worried about what he could be doing and the reality was is he can't control that aspect of the car so they took it out. So what the point there is KPIs matter in some instances and not and you won't know if they matter until you start measuring them. Tennis players use KPIs too. You know if you win or lose when you walk off the court but unless you know how many forehand winners you've hit and how many backhand winners you hit you don't know where it is that you need to be paying attention to in your game so that you can turn that loss into a win. Cricket are the king of KPIs. They have so much historical data we can borrow from them to make our businesses better. So given the failure rates of small business in Australia, it's probably safe to assume that not everybody is aware of what their business health is like because they aren't measuring it and they aren't monitoring it. The great news is that it's really easy to take steps to start to change that so that you can work out what's critical to measure for your success of your business and meet the goals of your business. So, Turn and chat to, for the next two minutes to the person next to you. How do you tell if your business is running well? What really convinces you? What things are you measuring now and what could you be measuring? All right. This is a screenshot of our No More Knots dashboard. It's not in your notes. <laughs> Here's what convinces me that our business is running well. We track the number of clients that we see on a daily basis the number of clients that we see on a weekly basis, our revenue on a weekly basis, the number of new patients that we've seen on a weekly basis, the number of new patients that we're seeing again, so our retained new patients, the number of existing patients that we've seen for that week, the number of existing patients that have another appointment on the diary, the number of missed appointments that we had, the number of cancelled appointments that we had. Our red ones are our personal bests for a particular day. The yellow ones track public holidays. That gives you interesting information too. And our average dollar spend per client. So um, when a client comes in, sometimes they'll be in for an hour and a half, sometimes they'll be in for half an hour, sometimes they'll buy additional stuff that goes along with it, Epsom salts, whatever it is that they might be, so it just tells us how much that person is. Most in interesting one thing about that average dollar spend though is none of the things that I've just mentioned, but comes down to what discounts we give as well and the effect that discounts have. So that's not something I have built into this, but good question. Um, so some of these KPIs, uh, some of these measures um, are more important for us than others and it's interesting the ones that we found to be more important depending upon what's going really well in our business and what's going really badly. So I'll talk more about that in the sixth key, but KPIs matter. So what KPIs are you tracking in your business? Sorry, can you just through Okay. No, 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 I can. Is there any particular that you were... Number per week? Yep. Um, number of clients per day, the number of new patients and existing patients that we see on a weekly basis, and the number of those that are coming back. The PBs that we do, the number of people that miss appointments, that tells you if your systems are broken. 
the number of people that cancel appointments, that tells you if you've got people who are doing hard sell on your customers to get them to come back and they don't want to. It also tells you if public, uh, sorry, if school holidays make a big difference and it also tells you if the length of time that you've prescribed for your client to come back is actually not really working for you. Um, I think that covers off on most of them. So we've also got average of, ad, averages for those at the bottom, which you can't see um, across the year as well. Yeah. We've got data on each therapist. Um, yes. And we report on that fortnightly. At the moment, we report on it daily. I'll talk about that in a minute. Why are you including public holidays? Is that lost work days? So the ones that there's no data, there's no work on those days. So we actually only close about. We're open seven days a week. So we actually only close about eight days a year. Yeah. So what public holidays tell you is that if you close on a public holiday, it then gives you an idea what your diary is going to look like, whether or not it's the week after or two weeks after a public holiday. Because if you've got that big chunk of repeat business and not tracking forward through your business, you can start to see patterns. It just helps you build things into your business more systematically. All right. Key number three. You need to document your systems. You would never dream of getting behind the controls of one of these things without reading the manual first, and your business is absolutely no different. So documenting your systems might feel a little bit pointless when it's just you or one other person, but as your business starts to take off, you'll quickly understand why it's important, otherwise you will come crashing back down to earth. So when I say document your systems, I'm not just talking about how to use your software package. I'm talking about the values that underline why it is that you do the things within your business that you do. I'm talking about how you do it. So the consistency of how you do something, regardless of who it is that does it. You need to be able to help all of the people within your business perform the same task in the same way, regardless of who it is that's completing that. What are your minimum standards of employment in relation to dress, computer literacy, sales skills, communication, all of those things become part of your document. How do you capture the history of your business? People will come in and start in your business today. How do you pay homage to and honour the people that have made your business into what it is today? The way that you capture that and the way that you help the people that come into your business today moving forward to be able to see what it was like behind them is by capturing that in your systems and your documents. That way you can respect the people that made the business into what it is and you can help them do things the way that people have historically done and taught us to do things successfully. You need to trust your people to do the things with your way but with their flair. Our systems are constantly evolving because people that come into our business show us better ways to do things and that's great because we write them down and we show everybody else. So turn and talk to the person next to you. What are you documenting in your business right now? What could you be documenting? I'll give you another couple of minutes. Right, so your policies and procedures manual is your recipe book. It's your business recipe book for how to run your business. It's the how-to manual to emulate everything it is that you do and that you value. It's everything from how you greet the customers at the front door to what it is that's the answering machine content for your Christmas message. Without document system, documented systems, you'll find that you do everything twice and without consistency. And that is a waste of your valuable time. So for example, how do you manage price increases? It's something that you won't just do once, you'll do it a number of times. So what's your lead time that you want to notify your clients for, for the price increase? How many weeks, how many days? Choose it, write it down. What media are you going to use? What's your wording going to be? And are you going to have a number of different types of wording based on different clients? You might have some VIPs and you might have some Gen Ys and you might have some elderly people that you need to accommodate. So you may need a variety of wordings. Write it all down. It becomes part of your policies and procedures manual. How are you going to train your receptionists to deal with the people that they're going to be communicating that message to? What's the scripting that you're going to help them to feel confident to do their job in an area that's potentially quite tricky? What's your therapist training? 
your therapists are also going to be on the receiving end of some of the conversations that are going to be around how it is that you're going to manage price increases. So what are the key steps you must take when you're answering the phone? That may seem like a really small one, but it's a really big one. Spend time, if you're in your own business now and you don't spend much time listening to the front desk answering phones, please do. They do a great job and they are the centre point of your business, but they need active encouragement as well. So how would you like your brand, which is your passion, represented? And that's what you need to capture. So no more not empower our people via our systems, policies and procedures. It allows them to deliver a consistently high quality service. Our message is true to our, true to our brand, our history and our passion. For me, it's essential that the business is not reliant upon me. If you want to get off the tools and let your business fly without you, documenting your systems is key number three. Key number four. Train your team. Spend time providing a framework so that your team can be supported as they grow. You set the parameters that encourage that growth. So training is not about creating clones. It's about giving intelligent people parameters to operate from. Those parameters set down a systemized way which you found to be the best way to achieve the results that your business, brand, customers and staff all need to achieve. It's our job as leaders and managers of our people to design and teach our systems to our people. This allows them to, this empowers them to blossom and grow within that and to reach heights that they may not have without your help. So how, you, how do you coach your people to deliver your systems consistently with the passion that it deserves every time? Turn and talk to the person next to you. How do you train your people right now and what could you be training them in? I'll give you two minutes. So, at No More Knots, we've got a, a training checklist for when a new therapist comes on board with us. It's at the moment a three hour induction that's about to go to four hours on the way that we do things within our business and what we expect of somebody who is our brand ambassador and who is going to be representing our business to our clients. Before they begin with us, they identify the things that they need to improve and the training needs that they have based on a rigorous self-assessment checklist, which some of the lovely people in this room have helped devise. And their training and coaching has been scheduled in accordance with their own assessment. Within the first week at No More Knots, they'll be exposed to a one hour training session on their approach to their client retention. And we find most therapists most new therapists that come on board with us are really quite uncomfortable with this concept. They, it seems to have attached to it a stigma of sales. But at No More Knots, we actually believe that customer retention is the best barometer of success that we have to measure how we're going as a business and, in, as, and as an industry. What better compliment can you have? Yeah. So we spend a lot of time coaching our people on the mental models that actually exist around customer retention. Um, it's a KPI that we consider we consider successful for our client outcomes as well. Because if someone's not coming back to see you, how on earth can you help them? So there's many aspects of outstanding customer service that go into retaining clients. And if, and if, your, thera if your therapist's values and beliefs aren't necessarily aligned in that area, it's really, a, a, it's really a topic that's worthy of addressing. We spend a lot of time on this and we've seen the success of what that can do at No More Knots and we'll continue to find new ways of helping our team uh, through this very important aspect of customer retention. So what's your framework for coaching your team? Key number five, you need to provide growth feedback systems. Your people are amazing when they come on board with you, that's why you hired them. But all of us have untapped potential and we all want to improve. How do you help to continue to, how do you help your people to continue and grow and develop the essential things that are, that are required to make a fantastic therapist? To achieve this, they're going to require feedback. So the feedback's based on benchmarks that you have already set down and a lot of those will live in your KPIs. What, the way that you coach your people is going to dictate how you get the best out of your people and foster the qualities that are important within your business. That's going to drive your business success. 
So the fastest athlete doesn't necessarily win the race and the same is true in our industry. The therapist with the most knowledge is not necessarily the most popular with your customers and it's your job as a business owner to understand why that is and help the most popular therapist be a better technician and the best technician to be more popular with your customers. That process requires feedback. Feedback provides awareness. Awareness allows for development. Recognition of development encourages positive growth. Positive growth leads to a successful business. How you give that feedback and how you encourage this development is entirely up to you. Turn and talk to the person next to you. In relation to your staff, what areas do you want to encourage growth in? How do you provide recognition of achievements? So, now you understand how you're going to coach your team to develop their, um, to achieve their KPIs. So this is the framework that we provide that feedback wheel that we provide to our team to encourage growth. What we look for within our team is set down from the start. This wheel comprises of both measurable, it's not in your list, of both measurable and intrinsic components and they're all important. So, we've got our therapist skill set which is self-assessable, our raving fan stat, so that's our attention. So what we, I don't know if any of you have read the book Raving Fans, if not, it's a worthwhile read. Our tutorial and workshop participation and ongoing education. Thank you to those guys who are down here this weekend. Industry experience matters to us. Your ability and your willingness to build referral relationships. Your customer feedback, we send out surveys to all of our clients. Your work, work ethic, consistency and reliability. Your attitudes and contributing to positive clinic culture. Your ability to set annual <laughs> professional goals and the quality of your treatment notes. <laughs> so what you do... Hey? I love that slide. I know. <laughs> took us a long time to work that out. 15 years, sure. <laughs> so what you decide is important to your business. Like, you can make these up because what you decide, these are what matter to you in your business. Your, cap your, sorry, your customer feed client, what are they? Um, they're not customers, they're team, contractor, thank you. Contractor wheel will be different to ours because you may expect different things of your people. This is just ours and I can tell you right now in 12 months that's going to be different because we're constantly developing that. So how you get the best out of your people is decided by the strengths of your systems and your ability to train and coach your people and the continued, su continued success of your business will be guided by consistent quality feedback and your, ab your ability to deliver it well, measure it and make sure it's done with consideration. Key number six, nearly there, refinement. Fine wine is developed over time. You have goals to turn your grapes into wine. You have KPIs that you taste test to ensure that you have minimal wastage, that your grapes mature in the way that you need. You process every batch with, um, and the system to do that is documented and handed down through generations. You train your staff and entrust them to make sure that every barrel gets the attention that it needs. There are thousands of barrels and you can't do them all yourself. Wine is given feedback by a sommelier, coached into tasting the best it can possibly be and yet it has small but important changes that are made to it. Wineries thrive on refinement as, as consumers of great wine, I'm sure you can all agree that we taste the benefits of this refinement process. So turn and talk to the person next to you. What things are you refining in your business or treatments right now? And what could you be refining? Refinement is a process that No More Nots prides itself on. We are committed to finding the best and fairest way. And we're constantly challenging ourselves to be better and learn from our mistakes. We're not afraid of being better. Refinement, in my opinion, takes place for two reasons. You either plan to improve something and you implement it, or you make a mistake and you work like wildfire to fix it. Earlier this year, we refined our booking system. We found a new one that was better than the one that we had. We researched it, planned for it, 
them and with a lot of long hours and hard work by many, many people in our business, we launched it. It will be and is amazing. However, during the course of the crossover, we lost access unexpectedly to one of our most important KPIs. We lost the ability to report on customer attention. Now, if you've never tracked this KPI, it might not seem like that much of a big deal. To help reinforce why the six keys that I've spoken about today really do matter and can help your business, let's have a look at what happened to us. On the 8th of May this year, we launched our new system. 10 weeks after we launched it, I was speaking to a very concerned therapist about how quiet the clinic was and what a negative vibe and impact that was actually having. When clients aren't booked in on the diary, that puts pressure on everybody. If you're in business right now, you'll know what it feels like because you have a responsibility to your people. And the pressure that the therapists feel is real as well. They're not getting the income that they planned for. And I spoke to six very openly generous therapists within our business about why it was that they thought that that, that, that was happening. All of the reasons that they gave were external. Utilities bills increasing, the election was coming up, school holidays, global financial crisis, all of those things are reasonable things and I was worried about them too. If we'd moved from this point, we would have focused solely on getting new business and getting new clients takes time and costs money. All of you would be well aware of that. Fortunately, we had access to years of statistical data, KPIs or key performance indicators that helped us make better decisions. So before we did anything, we examined them more closely. And this is what we were able to work out. Our average new patient retention for the same period the year before was 43%. I'm not saying that's great. That's just what it was. Our new patient bookings were up by 20% on the year before. So we had a 20% increase in new business. Our reception girls were run off their feet. They were getting more calls than ever for new business. So, why the Gappy Diary? It didn't make sense. The week before we lost access to data, our retention rate was 40%. We know that because we still have that information. We knew we lost access to that report and we were working pretty hard to find out what the answers were to this. So it took us 10 weeks to get it and we worked retrospectively, but this is what we found out. Four weeks after we lost the data, our, our client retention was at 26%. 10 weeks after we lost sight of it, it was at 8%. 8. Now that we had our reports back, we could see where our red flags were. Pretty sure you can too. So we asked all of our team to get on board with discovering what it was that they were doing differently to 10 weeks ago. They did. Thank you. There were many small contributing factors, but three stuck out as crucial. I'll tell you what they were first and then why they mattered afterwards. So, number one, our therapists stopped rebooking their clients themselves. It was a new system and it was new. It took more time. So, to preserve um, customer, uh, what do you call it? Yes, they sent them to reception to avoid running late customer service. Our reception staff are already busy. They're taking 20% more calls than they have been previously. They had new systems to learn. The phone was, um, they had an increasing number of clients to rebook from the therapist paying them forward, so they were massively overloaded. We had clients that we could see walking out the door saying, I'll just call you. Disaster. Disaster. We lost the ability to report in our KPIs is the third point. We had no idea in what direction we were heading. We were an absolute rudderless ship and the results speak for themselves. So we went from being a well-oiled machine to a rusty gate in 10 weeks. So what happened next? We set new goals for our team. The new goals that we set down were 45% new patient retention and 60% existing patient retention plus a team bonus if they could restore that to the previous level. So these levels that we set down for these guys are what they were doing previously. We're not setting new, tar new goals, we're setting things that we know they can hit. They needed to do that 
by September 1st and keep it <laughs> and keep it there by 1st of November. We're not at the 1st of November yet. We're still in the middle of this. So now they had clear goals. The next thing that happened was that admin team worked tirelessly to produce KPI reports so that the therapist could see how they were going. Management could identify who needed help and who needed coaching and training in certain areas. They had restored access to KPIs. With the help of receptionists and the therapist and management team, we uncovered habits that people had changed. The habits are so, so important. They changed them without even realising it. The why they do it hadn't changed. We know why we do things, but the key changes had been on how they did it. How they did it and what they did really mattered. Our systems had changed. The formula for their success or the systems of rebooking their clients had changed. Their treatments were still of exceptional standard and we know this because we sent out customer feedback surveys and they were all still really strong. We had to retrain ourselves. Every day we provided our team with updates on goals for KPIs as individuals and as a team, every single day, and that took a long time. They got feedback, encouragement, support and help to identify and pay attention to those habits, which led to better client outcomes as well. Because we were able to provide feedback for our team, we were able to coach them and they were aware of the growth opportunities that they had and they were empowered to take ownership of that. So because they were empowered to take ownership of their behaviours and their, uh, their awareness, we saw positive changes. Feedback is essential. We now track a whole new range of KPIs as a result of this, this year. And I'm grateful for, to our whole team for showing me that there are indeed refinements that can be and need to be made every single day within our business. So after applying the six keys, two weeks later, the team achieved an amazing 57%. Same team, same customers, new goals, new systems, new training, ongoing refinement. Summary, right? Who can remember the first key? Goal. Thank you. Begin with the end in mind. Know what you want your picture to look like. Number two, KPIs. What are you measuring in your business? You need a dashboard? How will you know if you've made progress if you don't know where you've come from? Number three, document your systems. Businesses are hard to fly. They need to fly the same way consistently all the time. What are you documenting in your business? Number four, train. Teach your systems to your people. Empower them to blossom and grow into the frameworks that you provide. Number five, feedback. Coach your people to develop skills to be better versions of themselves. Communication success will drive them and your business forward. Number six, refinement. Make adjustments along the way. Make them regularly. Review and improve five other keys and it'll lead you down the path of business success. There's a lot of smart people in the room today. I hope that I've been able to share one or two things with you that will be new that you'll be able to take and implement on Monday. Even if it's just one, I'll be super happy. Um, now I suggest that all of you go and enjoy a glass of refinement this evening while you talk about your road to success. Thank you, Jimmy. So if they're employees, then they're not subcontractors. So that one question is a very, very interesting one. Um, it's a very good question because it's a real trap for our industry. What basis do you start with? So we do have some employees and we do have ma the majority of our therapists are, are subcontractors. And we spend a lot of time working out the grey areas on that. So that's a really good question. So if you've got a really good solicitor and you've got a really good HR consultant, my suggestion is that you spend some time talking to them about that because it's essential that you do. 
we've got some soft tissue therapists in the sense that we've got remedial therapists, we've got um, MST, so this is the Pandora's box that we've been talking about for some time now, what is our industry about? So we do have MSTs, RMT. so at the moment we've just changed the way that our pricing structure works and we have three tiers of therapists within our business. So we have um, remedial therapists, senior remedial therapists and musculoskeletal therapists or expert remedial therapists. Question. Um, so what we found within our business is the mo when the, we have modalities from MST to RMT, that doesn't necessarily change. When you're talking about physio, that does change. Um, and then the other modalities we have had within our business previously, we have a physio now, um, but the other modalities that we have had previously, we haven't tracked that in their business. And I know without even looking at their data, because I know how to look at stats now. We've never tracked it previously for them, but if they do implement some of this stuff, then I believe they're all really awesome practitioners, but they could never build a sustainable business. And I believe part of the reason that they couldn't do that was because they didn't understand how to rebook their clients. And that in itself is a whole nother presentation, but that's a good question. So I don't know the answer to that. Well, I know the answer to that. I don't necessarily believe that I have full answers to why. There's no fast answer to that. Um, sorry, there is a big, there is a good answer to that. That's why we spend a whole hour doing it with our people when they come on board with us. So there are things, so we have some rules. We absolutely have some rules. We have frameworks of which we have. So we're talking about lots of IP now, intellectual property. So we have a lot of things that we understand need to go into conversations within treatment. I know that if you're going to summarise things within, within your treatment, my personal framework that I have, and I know some of these guys will have different frameworks that they suggest, you absolutely need to start wrapping up in the last 10 minutes and you need to start going through what was really good this session, what wasn't really good, what responded well, what homework they need to be doing. All of that stuff needs to start 10 minutes before the end of the session because what happens if you don't, then it starts about two minutes before the session finishes and they don't really have enough time because they've got another client okay goes to go and then they say the four worst words I never ever want to hear and it's see how you go ever band 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 so yes we do have frameworks and the key to that particular aspect I believe is one of the reasons why as a business we have managed to be successful within an industry that is statistically extremely difficult. It's because we have A, awesome people to start with, but we've been able to help with their help and borrow from techniques that each of them have, which they all have new bits that we borrow from on things that they do. So for example, even positioning yourself at the start of a session, if you're running late, don't walk out and go, I'm so sorry to keep you, because positioning, you've then got to work so hard to get back in front. You say, thanks, for, thanks so much for waiting. The person goes, oh, it's okay they feel good about going into the treatment. So even things like that and thinking about how it is that you're positioning things from the start make a big difference about getting those mental models around. Because within our industry, we want to help the people within our industry and we don't want to be seen as salespeople, but we also potentially have a little bit of a feeling about we need to fix people. And so if you've got these things that exist, they kind of butt up against the heads of your values and beliefs. And if they're not aligned, then it's a matter of making changes so that you can feel really comfortable about standing in front of somebody and saying I need to see you as opposed to oh look see how you go and um, you know maybe oh look um, do those stretches and hopefully stuff will sort itself out hope you had a good treatment today I'll get you a glass of water so having a look at the language that's used is something that we spend a lot of time on we're about to video so we're talking about refinement we're about to spend time videoing how it is that these guys teach our people what goes into treatment planning and the structuring of how you retain clients because fundamentally the treatment planning side of things is a huge part of that. The language that we use is different. Even things like inflection of words. So I know that Christy, for example, inflects her words totally differently to what I do. And she has an amazing capacity to coach people through things that I just go, oh, I don't even know how you did that. We're going to video all of that, find out how it is that each person does things the way that they do and why it works. And we're going to bring it all together and we're going to write it all down. And that's going to go into our systems, policies and procedures manual. process within here. So when you make big changes like that, I don't know how many of you could hear that question. Could you hear that okay? 
No? Okay. So Anthony's question was, how, what have we, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what have we noticed within the business that's changed? So what were the therapist's feelings around having to take your clients and say, you used to pay $88 for a massage, now you're paying 105 So what was the feeling for the therapist and what was the feeling for the customers? Is that right? Um, so there was, for some therapists, extreme delight that that distinction was changing and because when you have new therapists come on board with you and they're char being charged out at the same rate as somebody with 15 years of experience then there are reasons I know Kisco for example doesn't necessarily subscribe to that theory in his business and there are reasons for it you do now okay <laughs> you've seen the light <laughs> it's not about saying like I get why there's reasons that you don't do it as well um, so for some there was delight when you've got a team of 50 there's a big cross-section of that we had some people petrified we had some people who were so worried that they weren't going to retain business and that that business was going to mean that the clients wouldn't book in to see them if they went up into the next bracket so even though their skill level absolutely means that they should be sitting in the middle or the next one above didn't want to move and haven't moved until they feel comfortable enough to actually make the jump so for us, we weren't able to coach that person as well as what we would have to feel like that was something that they could do. So don't hold that person back? We don't hold them back, they held themselves back. Okay. So. Some of these guys in the room sat down and worked out what it was that this particular practitioner was going to be able to provide to that customer that that particular practitioner didn't necessarily have the level of skill in that area and we were able to create a matrix that helped people understand that. Now I will absolutely admit not every single one of our clients was excited about the change but our numbers haven't gone down. So from a subcontractor standpoint, we the contractors are uh, remunerated based on the hours or the treatments that they're doing. So if they have downtime, that actually doesn't necessarily affect the business as a whole. So we don't track that. They're pretty acutely aware of it and we can see on the diary whether or not it's gappy and we're very conscious of that. Yeah, right. So yeah, that's a good point. So you're talking about two different things. You're talking about client retention, but then also therapist retention as well. Yeah. Therapist retention is tracking your ability to retain your customers is not something that's always warmly welcomed by therapists and we still have therapists that are really uncomfortable about being measured against that for a variety of reasons and usually the people that are most resistant to it are the ones that haven't yet worked out the best way to do that and we can very clearly see and we could see it when our diary became gappy and we were trying to work out what it was that was happening within the business we had some of our best practitioners with gappy diaries and it just didn't really make sense because they're always busy. The phones are still ringing. So once we could tie together and be able to show them that their ability to retain their clients will directly influence their ability to be busy, then that is quite a powerful thing. But I'll just add to that to say that we are not interested in getting people back in the door for the sake of it. They need to be really clear about that and sales pitching is not something. So again, when we come back to the coaching side of things, understanding what it is that your drivers are, what your goals are from the treatment standpoint mean the difference between feeling really comfortable to get those people back in on your diary. Another interesting thing when you start looking at your ability to retain clients, and I know Hisco measures his differently to what we do. So I think your system measures whether or not the number of point a number of spots somebody has in the future is that right that's an interesting way of measuring it as well so there are a number of ways that you can measure um, the potential of your therapists within your business so one of the one of the therapists that we had and he's a lovely lovely guy quite a strong practitioner but absolute like we had to teach him how to shake hands so when you when you're dealing with that level of uh, just lack of confidence, unnecessary lack of confidence. And I'm sure some of you will understand what I'm talking about when I can see some nodding heads, one nodding head. <laughs> when you're talking about lack of confidence, these guys know their stuff, but they just don't necessarily back themselves. And so he was rebooking his clients and his retention rate was quite high. It was over 50%. And that's what we consider our absolute base minimum as, as a combined 50%. Um, 
Because if people, the way I look at it is pe if someone's brave enough to ring up and pick up the phone and say, I'm going to come in and I'm going to get my gear off in a clinic that I've never been to before, they have a problem that was causing them enough pain to actually take steps to get it. You're not going to fix them first go. They're going to be back in to see you. So he was, he was retaining his clients. But one of the things that we found was that he was retaining them and when we looked at the length of time that he was saying, okay, you need to come back in for, it was six plus weeks. So in six weeks, I don't know, probably telling you something you already know, but within six weeks, A, your pain is absolutely back, and then you assign the fact that your pain is back to a lack of success of the treatment. The treatment may well have been fantastic, but he actually needed to see them within four to seven days, not six weeks. So even just the way in which people leave your clinic and the way that they're thinking about whether or not that clinic, sorry, that treatment outcome was successful, those are the sorts of things that you can start to have a look at as well. So. Again, that's another system that we needed to refine, which is in part why we changed our booking system so that we can track that data more effectively and help coach our people to say, look, you're trying to do certain things and the thinking behind it is good, but confidence matters. Remuneration or whole? We don't do percentages is my first point. I'm a big anti-percentage person for a stack of reasons. Um, Probably based on that contractor, well, largely based on that contractor feedback wheel that you saw just up there previously. And then we've also got, in addition to that contractor wheel, another matrix that we've got that determines a whole bunch of levels which none of our contractors actually see. That's something from a management standpoint that helps us make sure that the way in which we remunerate our staff is fair and um, pays homage to those things that are up there. And what we weight how we weight things is important as well because you might have an absolutely amazing therapist across the board and you know I love 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 our people but sometimes they we have a bunch of really wonderful feelers in our clinic and they get so worked up about so many things and sometimes the tea room becomes this massive negativity because of something that happened and someone and that, that matters, like you need to make sure that that's something that they can confidently pay attention to because that really does affect the environment. So.